Good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you. My name is Devin. I'm the lead pastor here at Berean. I noticed there's a, seems a little bit more busy than normal. I wonder if that would have anything to do with the time change or not. I'm not sure, but I'm glad to be with you. It's a joy to be here as we continue studying and walking through the gospel of Mark. You know, when Jesus came to this earth and, and he conducted his earthly ministry, he didn't spend his time in an ivory tower as an academic writing theology textbooks. What he did instead was he went around and he preached. And in his preaching ministry, in his teaching ministry, the most common form of teaching that remains for us today is the use of parables. Parables are these short, punchy, little moral stories that have a lesson to them. They often use comparison, use hyperbole, exaggeration. They feature similes, a comparison using like or as. You know, think of the tortoise and the hare. It's kind of a modern day parable. Think of Aesop's fables. Or think of the little boy who cried, Wolf. You know, interestingly enough, I had never heard that expression until I moved here to America. In Canada, it's the boy who cried beaver. <laughs> and I grew up with a huge, tremendous fear of beavers. <laughs> it's a real thing up there. I lost some friends to beaver attacks when I was young. And uh, I think Netflix is actually going to make a movie out of it, I've heard. So. But this was a common form, and throughout the Gospel of Mark, in this next section that we're coming to, Jesus is going to use parables in his teachings. And what's fascinating about Jesus as a teacher is that if you look at some of these parables and some of these teachings, if you look for anywhere that you see red letters in Scripture, what you will notice is that it is unbelievably well-crafted. Like when you look at some of these parables, you think you could not take a line out of it and still have it land the same way. Jesus is a master teacher. And today, I want to look at one of his most <clears throat> well-known parables, the parable of the sower. You see, Jesus was often using everyday items and turns of phrase that his people would be familiar with. Right? He talks about agriculture, seeds, and sowing. He talks about landowners and, and benevolent, kind masters and ruthless, harsh masters. And what we see specifically today is that for those who had ears to hear, for those whose hearts were soft and were receptive, Jesus' parables actually reveal more. They teach They instruct and they guide. But for those who hardened their hearts, Jesus' parables don't reveal, they actually conceal. That Jesus comes and he says, I have taught you with clarity. I have performed my miracles. I have done all of this work. And if you are continuing to harden your heart, eventually you're just not going to get it. So if you're able today, I want to invite you to stand with me as I read from Mark chapter 4, the parable of the sower. Perhaps it should more aptly be called the parable of the soils, because that is what's going to make the difference. I'm going to read verses 4, chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. I'll invite you to grab a seat, and then later I'll work through the rest of this passage. This is, church, the word of the Lord. It says, again, he began to teach beside the sea. And a very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into the boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And when he was teaching them many things in parables, and in his teaching, he said to them, listen. Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell among the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it, did not, uh, where it did not have much soil. And immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. 
Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding 30-fold, 60-fold, and a 100-fold. And he said to them, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to him, and you can be seated. The crowds have begun to gather. People are noticing and taking notice of Jesus in his ministry. And so the crowd gathers around him so much so that he actually retreats to a boat on the water to amplify his voice. I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but even recently on Friday, my wife and I were walking with her family around uh, in Lebanon Hills around a lake. And she was quite far ahead of me. We hadn't had a fight. She didn't storm off or anything like that. But with kids, what I envisioned being a nice little walk together in the woods ended up being like, okay, one's running ahead. One's got distracted by a snail or something like that. So we were separated. And there was one section where we came to an inlet over the body of water around the lake. And Heather was probably 200 yards away from me, directly across the water. And because it was calm, because it was still, I called out to her to show her and let her know where I was on the path, and she could hear me clearly. The voice amplified so much so that I could hear my five-year-old daughter call out to me and and say something nice and, and let me know where she was. There's something about being on the water that amplifies the acoustics and it increases the reach. So Jesus here is seeking to reach maximum people because he's sowing the seed. And he explains this parable, and it's pretty self-explanatory. There's not much to really say. A sower, that is somebody who is casting out seed to prepare a garden of growth of some kind. Some of the seed falls along the path, and the birds come and devour it. Birds would follow the, the sower around. They knew that this was a quick nutritional opportunity. I grew up on the east coast of Canada, near the water. So going to the beach, people having cottages, I mean, this happened all the time. And if you weren't careful, you'd go to a food truck and you wouldn't be aware that these vultures or these seagulls are circling. And before you know it, there's a seagull swooping down to steal your corn dog. And your day at the beach is ruined. This is why we have scarecrows, right? Not at the beach in Canada. Some of you are picturing that wrong. (laughs) But in gardens, we have scarecrows, right? Because there's always birds around seeking to swoop in and and either take the seed or or, or pluck up the, the new little growth that is occurring. Some seed fell on the path. Some seed fell on the rocky ground. Now, interesting to know that Jesus is not here speaking about soil that has rocks in it. You know as well as I do that Plants can find a way to get through rocks and sidewalks and driveways, and they can get their roots down. What he's talking about here in Israel is a layer of bedrock, limestone specifically, bedrock that existed just a few inches beneath the soil. So it looked fine. The seed would be sown, and it would grow up quickly because it couldn't permeate the the limestone bedrock beneath it. It had nowhere to go but up. So it shoots up. And if you were a new farmer, if you weren't experienced, you would look at it and you would say, oh man, look, this is gonna be my best harvest yet. It's growing already. Not realizing that the reason it's spreading so quickly is because it has no root. The sun comes out, it is scorched, it can't access water, and the plant withers, the plant dies. Then there's the seed that is thrown into the soil with the thorns. And the weeds grow up and choke it out. If you've ever had a vegetable garden or even a a flower garden, and you go away for a summer vacation, you come back in a few weeks, and it looks like the Amazon. It's unbelievable. I mean, I've spent hundreds, literally, hundreds of hours in my backyard over this last year addressing and dealing with this invasive species called buckthorn. It's everywhere. So I'm out there with a pickaxe and burning it up and trying to drill the roots out. And people keep saying to me, oh, you know what you need for buckthorn? You need goats. And I'm like, okay, that's very helpful, but I don't have a goat. 
I couldn't bring one across the border. I had to leave it. So what do I do with that? I'll say this. If you have a goat and you want to hang out some Saturday, hit me up. But these weeds would grow. The sower has sown and it's choked out. The plant withers. The plant dies. Ah, but Jesus says, some of the seed that is sown goes to the good soil. And it produces 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold, even 30-fold. Even that smallest amount that Jesus references would have been a supernatural harvest. So Jesus is here saying that the harvest is far more than we would ever imagine. 30-fold is mind-blowing, let alone 60 or 100-fold. This is the parable of the soils. You know, and if you didn't know that there was a deeper spiritual meaning to the parable, you would say, oh yeah, that kind of makes sense. You know, we try things, we work hard, you know, we take an initiative and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But again, Jesus in offering this parable is hitting at a deeper truth. And so his disciples wisely ask him. If you're following along, look at verse 10 now. He tells this parable that has no overt spiritual meaning on the surface. And then when he was alone, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parables. This is actually a really wise move on the part of the disciples that they didn't understand the implications of his teaching, and so they asked him. I mean, the disciples don't get a lot of credit for their wisdom in the Gospels. Oftentimes, they're, they're making missteps, or they're not understanding something fully. Here, they do what is right. That if you today struggle to understand God's word, if you're like, hey, I just got a Bible, I'm trying to understand it, take some time and pray and ask God to help you understand, to help you handle his word correctly. This is exactly what they do. And Jesus, in kind of typical Jesus fashions, offers them an answer that at first can be quite confusing. They say, Jesus, what does this parable mean? And look at what he says in verse 11. To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables. So that they may indeed see but not perceive. They may indeed hear but not understand. Lest they should turn and be forgiven. It's a pretty interesting way for Jesus to frame it, isn't it? I mean, that's a little bit confusing as we read it today. What, what is Jesus saying here? I mean, what does he mean? Well, when Matthew, say for example, utilizes and quotes through this parable, he softens the language a little bit, but the sentiment remains. So what is Jesus saying here? Well, Jesus is actually quoting from the Old Testament. He's quoting from the prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah is a fascinating book of the Bible. I mean, textually, the history of the, the actual manuscript evidence that we have for Isaiah is fascinating. You can look into that with the Dead Sea Scrolls and so forth. But Jesus is quoting this Old Testament book that at once is incredibly evangelistic. So Isaiah, writing 700 years before Jesus, you know, he is writing this beautiful, hope-filled, visionary Revel, like revelatory word about the future. That someday a Messiah is gonna come, the anointed one, the suffering servant is going to come and, and good news is coming, yet it's also a message of judgment. That Israel had consistently hardened themselves against God and his word. So what Jesus is saying here in quoting Isaiah chapter six is that for those who have hardened their hearts, these parables they're not gonna land. But to those whose hearts have been softened, to those who have ears to hear, they're gonna get it. 
Yes, those outside, they can still repent. They can still turn to Christ. They can still soften their heart and believe. But Jesus is saying, I'm not gonna give you more proof. Like sometimes I'll meet people even today who will say things like, I would believe in Jesus. I would uh, explore Christianity as a serious option for my life if. If God gave me more proof. Oh, if I saw God with my own eyes. If I saw a miracle, then I would believe. If there was more evidence, then I would believe. Do you recognize what an insane posture that is to take when you speak to the God of all creation? To say that you, God, need to jump through these hoops for me? Man, we are created beings. God is not beholden to any one of us to behave or to act in certain ways. What God has done is revealed to us in his word and through his son and in his spirit, through his creation. So the issue in you believing or not believing in Jesus is not the proof that he has or has not given you. The issue here is not one of evidence or of proof. It's of the condition of your heart. These people here saw all these miracles with their own eyes. They heard the demons shriek out in terror as God himself steps and walks among them. Yet they failed to believe. The issue is not that God has not given you enough proof. The issue is that you refuse to believe the evidence that he has given you. So in light of that, then Jesus transitions in verse 13 to explain the entire parable. He says, you want to know what I'm talking about? Let me tell you. You have asked me. Let me explain it. So he says, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the others? The sower sows the word. So the sower here being Jesus, but also through the apostles and the spread of the church and the the great commission, it's all of us who would call Christ as king who share the good news of Jesus Christ. Sowing the seed. I mean, Sunday by Sunday, within your homes, with your coworkers, with your neighbors, with your friends, you sow the seed. Well, what is the seed? The seed is the word. The word the good news of Jesus Christ and his kingdom. The good news of who Jesus is and what he's going to accomplish. So just like a sower goes out and he casts his seed over the prepared soil, we as believers, we as a church, we cast the seed. You see, this parable ought to be called the parable of the soils because it's the soil that makes the difference. And Jesus explains what these four soils represent. And my question for you is this. Are you one of these soils today? Do you resonate with some of these temptations Let's look at what Jesus has for us. He starts with explaining what the soil along the path is all about. He says, so this soil along the path where the birds would come in and steal, listen to this. I'll tell you what that represents. The sower sows the word, and these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, though, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. Do you recognize that as you sow the word in your day to day, that in our kids program that knocks it out of the park, that in our young adult ministry, in our youth ministry, in our ABFs, in our small groups, here today in this moment, that as God's word goes forth, as the word is sown, there is a spiritual battle taking place. And I'm not just talking about getting random hunger pangs during a church service. When I was a kid, I was convinced that was the devil. 
Because I, I never remember being as hungry as I was at 11.30 on Sunday morning. I'm not just talking about cell phones ringing, right? I'm talking about something much more nefarious. Were you here? the glory of Jesus Christ proclaimed. You hear that your maker offers you grace, even though you are currently his enemy. You hear the message that complete and total forgiveness of sins is possible because Jesus Christ died for you. And the only thing that you can think of when you hear that message is how much it's gonna cost you to follow him. Wondering, is it really worth it? I mean, some of Jesus' views seem a bit antiquated and old-fashioned. And all you do is see the cost of following Christ. And in the end, you walk away saying, yeah, that's not really for me. Satan and his demons. I mean, Satan obviously is not omnipresent. He cannot be everywhere at once. He is not God. He's a finite created being. But his demons and his minions, they work to distract. They work to remove the seed that is planted within us. All the distractions that come about, all the criticisms, all the critiques... Don't be surprised that as you sow the seed that you see aspects of that spiritual battle being worked out. This is why we pray. Do you get that? I mean, once a month now, we've introduced this elder-led prayer night that we host right here in the commons. It's not flashy, It's pretty simple. We worship together and we pray. Here's why we pray. Because we want that seed to take root. We don't want to see Satan, to see his demons snatch this seed away in all of their cunning and unnerving and and manipulative ways to confuse and cloud the message of Jesus Christ. Expect a spiritual battle. Pray against Satan and his demons and sow the seed with hope. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we are told that Satan blinds the eyes of unbelievers to stop them from seeing the glory of God in the face of Christ. That's why the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. And so many of us would say, I I don't get why people don't see it. I know Jesus. I've been transformed by him. I love him. It's a spiritual battle. And this is why we pray. There is seed that is sown along the path. There is also, Jesus explains, that seed that is sown on the rocky ground. And this, he says, are those who When they hear the word, they immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a little while. Then, when tribulation and persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. There are those, Jesus says, who receives the word with joy. I've seen this pastorally in a number of instances where people's lives are, maybe they're gone off the rails and things are hard. And so they try this Jesus thing out and they get kind of excited at first. But then things don't get better. Mom's sickness gets worse. The financial strain increases. Life gets hard. And these hardships, these tribulations, they lead to a hardening of heart and people walk away. Maybe you at one point, maybe you're here just to keep someone happy today. 
And you would say, I, I don't believe this stuff. I mean, I tried Christianity. When I was younger, I, I thought I believed, and I, I went to youth group, I went to summer camp, I did all these things, but it's not for me. I tried Christianity, and it didn't work for me. You know, Christianity is not something that you try. It's a relationship with the resurrected Lord. And coming to a new place, being a part of a new community, getting to know a church can in some ways maybe be a little bit exciting. And you receive it with joy. But if your roots do not go down deep into the person, the living person, and the finished work of Jesus, as soon as that sun gets hot, as soon as the tribulation the, the hardships, the trials come, and you're just gonna fall away. You need something stable, something enduring. You need roots down deep. You know, I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet, but I think this parable, and specifically this rocky soil, imagery that Jesus gives us is going to be especially pertinent in the coming decades. You see, there will be many who will claim to follow Jesus, who will recognize that to truly bow the knee to Jesus Christ as Lord is going to mean running afoul of the dominant world system that is out there right now. And Christians, sure, we can have a persecution complex. Or just because somebody doesn't like you, that doesn't mean it's persecution, right? And we should be quick to endure and forbear, not necessarily simply quick to complain. But our society right now, in all facets, from government to academia to social media and big tech to Hollywood, Man, they have unequivocally bowed the knee to this demigod of cultural issues. And if you or I dare raise our head and say, you know what? Like we just sang, we worship another king. And I'm not gonna bow down to your demigod of tolerance. And I'm not gonna bow down to your way of thinking because there is truth and I've met him and his name is Jesus and he's the king, he's the one I serve. That if you do that, there's gonna be hardship. There's gonna be persecution. There's gonna be trials. So let me ask you, do you have your roots down deep? Because if you haven't wrestled through these things, if you haven't made the decision in your mind to follow Jesus as Lord and you're just hanging out here, how are you gonna withstand the cultural pressures that are coming? What you need is your roots down deep into the resurrected Lord. Jesus goes on and talks about the next soil, the third soil. The soil with the thorns. He says in verse 18, and others are the ones sown among the thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things enter in and choke the word and it proves unfruitful. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches and desire for other things. You know, these can be good things or bad things. I mean, the the cares of this world could be something, you know, God... It honors God when you're good at whatever he's called you to do. 
So if you practice law, if you practice medicine, if you're a contractor, if you're a nurse, whatever field you work in, doing it well brings glory to God. Being entrepreneurial, uh, strategic, tactical, these things, they honor God when you utilize the gifts that he's given you. But these things that are good and can honor God can also be a cause for us to fall away from God if they become ultimate. So this care of other things or the cares of this world and these desires for other things may not necessarily be, you know, scary, wicked, evil, obvious behaviors. It could be your looks. It could be your leisure. It could be a relationship. But if you're not careful, it will choke out the word. You know, weeds do not grow overnight to choke out a vine or a plant. These weeds, if given time, if ignored, if minimized, if excused, they will choke out the word. And the invitation then, even on, a, on, a, on, a, on an overview type reading, is to say, God, I don't want anything in my life that's going to choke out what it is that you're doing in me. I don't want to give room to the weeds in my life. I want to grow to health in you. These cares of the world. And one of the ways that you can see this borne out, I think, in our society today is the abject busyness that we're comfortable with. Right? I've seen families who, who come to church once a month because all these other cares of the world have taken over. And then as their kids get up, grow up, and they, they move away from home, their parents are all surprised and flustered that they're not following Christ in any way, that their faith isn't factoring into their day-to-day -day decisions, that they've stopped attending church. But man, if you, if you raise your kids to believe that, man, church is optional, it doesn't really matter. If you have the time, you should probably go. But it's like taking a vitamin. Not a big deal if you miss a bunch. You can probably get enough moral formation from eating your vegetables as well. You know, these cares of the world and the busyness and all these schedules and this next event and this next sport and activity. And I mean, that's just one simplistic example. You know, it could also be the cares of this world, but it could also be all the things that this world cares about. Again, all these dominant messages that were being fed day in and day out from the classroom to social media, being told, hey, you need to care about this and this alone. This is what matters the most. And how easily that can grow up into a weed to choke out God's word in us. And finally, I just want to make mention here. He says that it could be the deceitfulness of riches. He doesn't say the riches, the deceitfulness. You see, we live in a society that is so incredibly affluent that my goodness, we can deceive ourselves into thinking that it's just that next thing, that if we purchase it, if we get it, when we gain it, that'll provide rest to our soul. And all the busyness and all the hecticness and all the resources that we have, there are endless opportunities to distract ourselves from what God is truly doing in us. But he says, in the end, there is a good soil. He says in verse 20 that those who were sown on the good soil are the ones who, look at this, Hear the word and accept it. They go on to bear fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. You have almost unlimited ability to hear the word. Not just hear through podcasts, books, YouTube, you name it. You could try to sanctify TikTok by subscribing to a whole bunch of like Christian content. There's no shortage in hearing the word today. The issue is, will you hear the word and what? Accept it. 
Will you believe it? Or are you gonna consistently harden yourself and say, well, I've heard your word, but I'm gonna, I don't believe that part of it and I'm gonna ignore this part of it and that seems antiquated, God, so I'm not gonna hold to that anymore. No, the calling for you and I today is to hear the word of God and to accept it. No excuses, no qualifiers, but humble submission that recognizes Jesus Christ is Lord. I'm not, so I'm gonna listen to what he says and I'm going to accept it. This is the calling. It's to hear the word and to accept it. What does it mean to accept it? I mean, ultimately, it means to accept Christ. To say yes. Yes to forgiveness. Yes to his unparalleled and unmatched authority. Yes to his lordship over all things. Maybe you resonate with one of these soils today. I pray, first of all, that Satan, that his demons would have no authority, no power, and no ability to steal whatever seed God has planted in you. Maybe you resonate with the rocky soil, and it's getting hard. And you've thought about walking away. Maybe you resonate with this soil that has thorns in it. And these weeds in your life are growing up. They're clouding your vision and they're threatening to choke out the word planted in you. What's the remedy? What's the hope? What do you do with this? You hear the word of God and you accept it. That's how you live the life that you want to live. Because in the end, Paul, Jesus says, listen, those who hear the word and who accept it, they go on to bear fruit. 30, 60, 100, a life with purpose. A life lived in cooperation with God's eternal purposes for you. A life that makes a difference a life that looks different, a life that is fruitful. My prayer is that we as a church be a people who not only hear the word, but accept it. And in so doing, as we sow the seed liberally, that it would fall in good soil and that we would bear fruit. Let me pray. Jesus, I thank you that you are the master teacher. I thank you that it's not my word that somehow needs to to take root in people, Lord, but it's your word. And so, may we hear your word and may we accept it. As simple as that, Lord, may we hear your word consistently in the life and the rhythm of our church and our community. And may we as a people overwhelmingly say, Jesus, you are king, you are Lord. We accept your word. We accept you and in so doing to go out and to bear fruit to the glory of God. We love you. We praise you. We commit all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.